Good morning, and thanks for tuning in to Harbor Cove Online. If you're checking this out for the first time, we want you to know that we also have two campuses here in Gig Harbor that meet on Sunday mornings. You can check out our website, harborcove.church, for more information about who we are and what to expect if you join us in person. This morning, we are beginning a new sermon series called Just As I Am. During Lent, we are spending some time in God's Word exploring our relationship with God and who He says we are. It's important to know that you can come to Jesus just as you are. Our service is about to start, so settle in, get ready to worship, and thanks for joining us at Harbor Cove Online.
Hi, I'm Jonathan, and these are the three things you need to know this week. Number one, preschool. Enrollment is now open for our next year's classes at Harbor Covenant Preschool. Our preschool was founded in 2016 in response to our church's desire to serve our community. 
Harbor Covenant Preschool is an exciting, safe, and engaging place to learn and make friends in a Christian context. Our students grow socially and flourish in a learning environment that will prepare them for their elementary education. If you have a three to five year old kid ready for preschool, or you know of a family that does, we have the preschool you're looking for. Our classroom is so much fun. Our curriculum helps grow the minds, body, and soul of each kiddo. Our teachers are awesome. And of course, our students are amazing. Seriously, take a look. For more information, visit our brand new preschool website, harborcovepreschool.com. Number two, youth fundraisers. Our teenagers have some awesome opportunities this summer to get away from Gig Harbor and the stress and the drama of their world and all the distractions that plague them to an incredible opportunity for them to experience the reality of who Jesus is and the power that he has in their lives. Our high schoolers are attending Unite, an epic denominational conference in San Diego with thousands of students from other covenant churches across the country. Our middle schoolers are attending Mix, Another epic conference in Oregon with thousands of other middle school students in the Pacific Northwest. But to get there, they need our help. We are hosting a card fundraiser for the next three Sundays in the Gathering Place to help raise funds for travel and leader expenses. We believe it's a part of our calling as a church to provide for the spiritual growth of our students, and this is a great way to do that. If you're financially able and interested, stop by the table in the Gathering Place to find out how you can give. If you have more questions about the goals of the fundraiser, check out a longer video we shared on our Facebook page. Thank you so much for all of your support. Number three, fun fact. The largest hairball on record was taken from the stomach of a cow and weighed a whopping 55 pounds. Don't believe me? Head over to the Finney County Historical Museum in Garden City, Texas and take a look for yourself gross. And those are the three things you need to know this week. If you have any questions, stop by our welcome calendar and the gathering place, or you can visit harborcove.church. This is a picture of my wedding. My wife's family's on the left, my family's on the right. And yes, I did used to have hair. But the reason I'm showing you this picture is because I want you to just look at it and see, do I resemble my parents? Does my wife Kelly resemble her parents? You see, we are not just the genetic and biological product of two people. We are actually also the social emotional products of our parents. And who I am today has largely been formed or informed by who my parents are and who they were. And there's something about that that relates to the passage we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to dive in there in a moment. As you're turning to Genesis chapter 1, let me just frame for you this new sermon series we're beginning as we walk through this Lenten season. The sermon series title is called Just As I Am. And we're exploring the deepest questions of our lives, things that, that frame our identity. And we're going to answer those questions by finding that those answers are found in God. And in finding those answers in God, we actually find ourselves, our identity. So with that, let's dive into the passage that we're going to be studying today. And as we do that, I want to frame for you a bit about the passage. There are some things that the Bible says before the part that we're going to read that I think is really important to frame what we're going to be talking about this morning. And this is the message that God reveals in the beginning of the Bible. He begins with these words, in the beginning, God. God's message to humanity begins with this reality that God existed and God created, existed and created. He created reality the way that it is uh, for his own purposes and for his design, his, his structure, his way of viewing reality. And so that's really important to understand. 
Paul reframes it another way in the in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. He says this, All things were created by him. He created everything in heaven and earth. He created everything that can be seen and everything that can't be seen. He created kings, powers, rulers, and authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. All things created by him and for him. God didn't create something he didn't value. He valued that. His creation had value to him. And we're a part of that creation. And that's going to lead us into our study. Both God's creative power and that which he created has meaning to him, even if we struggle to see it or believe it. So with that in mind, let's look at the passage we're going to be reading. God's reality, his purpose and meaning for humanity is introduced in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. This is the part of the creation story where humanity is created. So listen along or read along with me, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Here's the first thing I want you to see from this passage. The entire passage reveals as a whole that we matter to God. You and me matter to God. God declares we have meaning, worth, and value. Uh, theologians call this the imago Dei, made in the image of God. God says that we were made in his image. He says in this passage that we're made to rule, we're made to multiply, we're made to cultivate and care for creation, the ground and the environment, plants and animals, and even numerical growth of the human population. God dignified humanity distinctly from all the other parts of creation. We're special to him. But that's not what the world tells us. Do you believe you're special? Do you believe that you matter to God? That's not the messaging we're getting from the world. The world tells us we have to do things, earn things. We have to perform. We have to look a certain way, be a certain way to be important, to have meaning, to have value. But God declares we have value just by being created by him. So God has initiated something that he's invited us to participate in. So we're created with dignity and created to participate. So God created us to co-create a future with him, his future. That's the invitation. So God initiates and then he invites and we get to respond. So not only do we matter to God, but what we do with our lives matters to God. And this is really important to understand as we move through uh, this series and as we move through uh, our discussion today. Your life matters and what you do with your life matters. I'll admit it's, it's, it's hard to believe our individual lives matter at times. So much of life uh, speaks to a different reality. But that's why important, it's so important to go back to the Bible because God tells us his reality by which it becomes a framework for us to actually have an anchor to live by, something that gives us security against all the other stories that society and culture wants to say. Society would have you believe that they're, you're a product of random accidents and by chance, without meaning or purpose, that all you're simply to do is to pass on your genetic code in hopes that it evolves into something better. And if that's reality, isn't it no wonder that we struggle with anxiety and depression and, and hopelessness? Because you don't matter in the world's eyes. You're somebody to be consumed and used for whatever anyone's whims wants. Right? Only the strong survive, so you better be strong. But that's not what God says. That's not his reality. I also find it's difficult for me to believe this because my default view of my own life isn't very positive, partly because of the messaging I've received, but also my own experience. 
My experiences in life haven't affirmed that reality because the world is operating from a different place. So my feelings about myself and then also my own limitations. I've, I've run into walls. I've, I've ran into the limits of my own ability and realized I can't do this. And all this ought to be a sign that God created us for more. That the way I'm viewing life, the way that I'm walking through life, the way that I'm living my life, which does matter, isn't built on the right source or foundation. Our lives matter and what we do with our lives matter. So we've got to come back to his reality. So you and I are a part of creation and you and I each serve a part in humanity, in creation, that only you and I can play. It's easy to believe that God cares about all of humanity. We read in John 3.16, for God so loved the world, right? And so we think, well, God loves everybody. So what makes me special? But I want you to really think about this. And let me give you a little illustration. Uh, a friend of mine has CLEAR, which is a way to get through uh, past TSA, uh, through the security at the airport, and you either do a retinal scan or you do a thumbprint, and you're right through. It identifies you. Why can they do that? Because your eyes, the way that they are created, your fingerprints, the way that they are designed are unique. Even your voice is unique. No one shares the exact same genetic code as you, otherwise they would be you. There's something special about the way that God created you and me that sets us apart. And he invites us to play a part in the larger part of humanity. So what we do really does matter. No one else was given your eyes. Eyes that get to see God and look to God. Gifts that can see and observe his work in this world. No one else was given the hands and the fingerprints that you have to leave your fingerprint on the world representing him and, and serving him and glorifying him. No one else can do that but you. No one else was given your voice that could sing or declare God's truth. No one was given that but you. What you do with the gift God's given us in being created in his image is really up to me and you. Let's dive further into the passage. We see in Genesis 26, the first part of it says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So mankind shares something in common with God's image and likeness. And the first part of that I want you to see is he says, let us make mankind. Let us, that sounds plural because it is. There's something crazy about God. He's so incomprehensibly complex and immense that he has diversity in himself. We use language that's not even in the Bible, but to try and capture that by Father, Son, and Spirit, Trinity. That word Trinity, you've probably heard it. There's this unique, orchestrated dance that God's doing with himself where he's expressed in multiple facets and God says, let us make humanity in our image. This diverse and complex God creates humanity with diversity. But while we can't contain that diversity in ourselves, he creates it in humanity in different forms, male and female. Both equally though differently reflecting God, bearing his image and his likeness. He goes on to say God created mankind in his, own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's verse 27. So God's image is not based on biological differences. Male and female are equally good and equally reflect God. But sin has distorted that reality, male and female. He's distorted that reality in how we treat one another, which has led to abuse, oppression, and evil. And that's what the effect of sin is when we operate out of the reality of the world versus the reality of God. It leads to a distortion of the reality that, that man and woman equally bear the image and likeness of God. And so we were called to rule together over creation, bringing our best differences together to extend God's reign and rule, to resemble him and reflect him back to himself, to one another, and to the whole world. 
And there's a beauty designed in this. Do you see it? Do you value it? How are we doing at listening to those who are different than ourselves and looking for Christ in them and what they would want to say in our lives and in our world? Let me go a little bit further. I just said that, that we were created differently because we do that better in order to resemble and reflect God. Resembling and reflecting. Humanity, it says in the scripture, is that we were created in the image of God uh, and in his likeness. And so the word for image is actually really close to the word resemblance. It's actually that's an, it's one of the words that's used in scripture. So the image that we were created in resembles, which is, means what's observable, what, what people can see. Just like you can look at me and then you can look at my parents and say, yeah, he's probably a mix of both of them. Or you can look at Kelly and see her parents and yeah, I could see a little bit of mix of, of one or the other. And, that, and that's one way that we bear images, that we can bear an image by what people can see with their eyes. But the other word likeness has more to do with personality, will, and consciousness. And, and that kind of personhood is only observed by the actions that we take, the personality that we express, and that only happens through relationship. And so what we do, how we act actually is the way that people see the likeness of God in us. So we're called to resemble God and reflect God. We're, we're called to demonstrate through how we live, how our character is structured and how it works itself out in life and how it's expressed in relationships with other people. I also want you to see that in verse 26b, that not only do we resemble and reflect God, but we resemble and reflect God in our rule over the rest of creation. Verse 26b says, he was created us in our, his likeness and image so that we may rule over the fish in the sea and in the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all creations that move along the ground. We resemble him when our character and nature is being formed in his likeness. We reflect him when we put him on display through our lives by our actions, our choices, and our priorities. We were created by him and for him to reflect his image back to him, to one another, and to the world. Uh, let me give you an illustration to help make this make sense. Imagine that you are a mirror. Like, no, you're literally the mirror. And if God were to look in the mirror, how much of himself would he see? Now, I'm not saying that because I want you to feel convicted. I mean, I'm saying that and I feel really convicted. But think about it. Like, how do I live? What do I really value? What do people see that I value? What is important to me? Where do I spend my time? What choices do I make? What do I do to serve others? How do I treat others? How hard do I really work at things? Am I reflecting an image of God? Think of yourself as a mirror. That's what we were created to do. We were created in the image of God to mirror God to the world. I want you to notice in, in, in the next verse that we're going to read is that those made in the image of God are given a task and responsibility. And that task and responsibility is actually inviting us to rule, to co-create, to actually steward the thing that God created. So God created, and then he invites us to partner with him in the growth of that creation. And we're actually participating in that creation, which is crazy. I mean, nothing else in creation was given that kind of dignity or responsibility. It says in verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the living creatures that move on the ground. Creation itself has an order and it was designed to be ruled by God through humanity, which bears his image. And the degree to which we bear his image, the earth, the world, and society is blessed. And the degree to which we don't, we see sin. We see the effects of sin. We see brokenness and hurt and shame and guilt and oppression and evil and injustice. God has called us to reflect his image. So how are we doing at that? A lot of times it could be really easy to say society's not doing that clearly. And yet, so often we look to society and get mad at society, or we get mad at just America for failing morally or failing to do justice, and we can, we can get mad on America, but God didn't come to save the world through America. He came to save it through his 
people, the church, through you and me. The responsibility to reflect Jesus is for those who know Jesus, who know God. Because if you don't know God, your ability to reflect him well and live out of his reality is going to be hindered. Do you see the image of God and the importance of it? Do you see how your life matters and, and what you do with that life matters? Do you see that being made in the image of God is, is an invitation to participate in something that God wants to do? Now, we've talked about the world. It's broken. Sin has affected it. Sin works against God's intention for humanity and creation. Sin, at the, at the core of sin, is a failure to resemble and reflect God and his perfection. And yet he invites us to participate in that. But how do we do that living in a sinful world? Well, God makes it really very, very clear. God sent Jesus to do something about the sin in order to restore and redeem, in order to resemble and reflect God. And when we look to Jesus and we look at what he's done and when God looks at us and he sees Jesus's life in us, he sees how Jesus resembles and reflects God. There's this verse that I just absolutely love in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God created humanity to bear his image. And listen to what God has done in Christ. It's a new creation. Verse 16, chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. So from now on, we don't look at anyone the way the world does. At one time, we looked at Christ that way, but we don't anymore. When anyone lives in Christ, he's a new creation. The new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All of this is from God. He brought us back to himself through Christ's death on the cross. And he's given us the task of bringing others back to him through Christ. God was bringing the world back to himself through Christ. He did not hold people's sins against them. I mean, is that the best news ever? That, that's for me and for you. God created, and he wants to recreate a new creation in us. He's recreating us as we look to Jesus, who re perfectly resembles and reflects the image of God. But we've got to look to him for his reality. We've got to see the invitation that he gave us initially is still an opportunity for us to, an invitation for us to join him in what he wants to do, in reflecting his beauty and his greatness and his awesomeness back to him and back to the world through honoring him, through serving him, through ruling under him. So I want to give you some time. I want you to, I want you to just to consider what does that require? What about refocusing the eyes that he gave us on him instead of the world or instead of on ourselves? What if, what if we began to reconsider the hands that he's given us and what we're doing with our hands and how we can seek him and what he wants to do with these hands he's given us, with these fingers that he's given us? What if we thought again about what our voice was actually created for? To bless, not to curse. To heal. To proclaim truth and love. To declare praises to God. What if we began to ask God to show us how to do that? What if we accept what Christ has done for us, how God views us, and began to live being a mirror, resembling and reflecting God to the world around us? I'm going to give you three questions and then a prayer that I would love for you to pray as you consider what God wants to do. The first is this. you got to be honest. What image do you really reflect? And are you okay with that? Are you at peace with that? If not, God might, not might, God is inviting you to do something about it, to make a choice, to trust him and believe it. Second question, do you sense a longing for a different reality, a different image, a better one to be true? And if so, will you let him show you a more accurate view of himself so that you can mirror him more accurately. And third, will you choose to believe that God created you in love to resemble and reflect him by trusting what Jesus has done and invited you into a new creation through him? 
hears that prayer, I would encourage you to pray as you reflect. Ask him to impress on your mind and your heart his desire for you. Then ask him to guide you as you seek to know him better, to relate to him differently, to, to love him more, and to become all that he intended you to be. Then take a deep breath. And I just want you to see him smiling at you, his, him delighting in you, and receive his joy, his peace, and his presence as you walk into the rest of your day. That's my hope for you. May you and I reflect and resemble Jesus better. May we live out the life of a new creation by the power of his spirit in our lives as we look to him for the true reality. And may we see him more accurately for who he really is and what he really desires in order that we can mirror and reflect that reality back to him and to the world around us. God bless you.
Thanks again for joining us this morning. If you'd like us to get to know you a little bit more, there's a button in the chat that you can click on to fill out a contact form, and we will be in touch. And if you're ready to take a next step in faith, visit harborcove.church. Your next step may just be a few clicks away. There are a few options right now on our homepage to check out, so click the Next Steps link in the chat to get started. If you would like to stay up to date on other things at Harbor Covenant, you can sign up for our weekly emails at harborcove.church, or you can text HarborCove to 55498 to sign up for our text updates. As always, if you can't make it in person next week, then we will look forward to seeing you back here at Harbor Cove Online. Now, here's Mark with the benediction. My friends, here's a benediction for you today as you leave and enter into what God has for you. God of all creation, who formed and fashioned us uniquely together in delight, May you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to live out our lives so that we may resemble and reflect you as we trust in the work of Jesus and rely on the power of the Spirit in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen.